Slasher films might well be the most popular subgenre of horror flicks, and it's pretty obvious why. When they're good, they're tense and frightening, and when they're bad, they're still often a good bit of dumb fun. Some of them, such as Scream, Halloween, and Friday the 13th, have done much better than any others. So let's take a look at some of the slasher movies that deserved a lot more hype than they got. I'm Tilly from What Culture Horror, and these are hidden gem slasher horror movies. Skinner. Admittedly, Skinner is somewhat of a mixed bag of a movie, but it totally deserves a mention on this list as A, most people have never heard of it, and B, Ted Raimi is absolutely fantastic as the film's headline act. Raimi is famed for being a great character actor and for small roles in the likes of Brother Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy and the Evil Dead franchise, but it's pretty rare to see Ted get to take the centre stage in a lead role. In Skinner, Raimi gets to do his best Norman Bates and Hannibal Lecter as uber creep Dennis Skinner. Viewed by the outside world as your standard everyman character, Dennis spends his spare time scouring the streets for people to skin. Having moved to a small town and become a lodger at the house of Ricky Lake's Kerry, old Dennis finds his past coming back to haunt him as one of his previous victims hunts him down. Still, that doesn't stop Skinner from slicing and dicing up the poor other fools while he develops a major crush on Lake's Kerry. Smothered. From writer-director John Schneider, yes, as in the Dukes of Hazard and Smallville actor, 2016 Smothered is a picture that has plenty to offer horror hounds. Firstly, Smothered features a multitude of familiar horror faces playing skewed versions of themselves. There's Kane Hodder of the Friday the 13th and Hatchet franchises. There's Bill Mosley of Rob Zombie's Firefly films and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. There's R.A. Mihailov, who played the titular beast in Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And then there's the super buff Don Shanks, who's best known for playing the infamous shape in Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. Invited to a trailer park and tasked with scaring punters, this group are expecting an easy payday. Well, that is until somebody starts to stalk and attack these horror favourites. With the aforementioned names spending so much time often stuck behind masks or heavy makeup work, it's great to see them take centre stage here, and it's likewise a refreshing change to see them play the hunted rather than the hunter. Throw in other impressive turns from Brie Grant, Amy Brasser and Shanna Forrestal, complete with a whole host of horror nods and Smothered is one of horror's best kept secrets of recent years. Nightmare Beach. At the core of Umberto Lenzi's Nightmare Beach, we have the rather novel presence of a slasher killer who speeds about on a motorcycle. Set during Miami's spring break, this 1988 picture features your run-of-the-mill pretty young things tormented by a mysterious biker with evil intentions. Before we get to that part of Nightmare Beach, the opening scene shows the leader of a local biker gang killed by electric chair for the murder of a woman. Proclaiming his innocence and swearing his revenge as he's shocked into the afterlife, the tease here is that said gang leader is back from the grave to to cause havoc on the streets and beaches of Miami one year later. Before you know it, partiers and bikers are being offed left and right, and the race is on to discover who is really underneath the murderous black and red motorcycle helmet. If nothing else, Nightmare Beach is worth checking out solely for their ever-brilliant Michael Parks in a supporting role as a local doctor caught up in the middle of this chaos and carnage. The Toolbox Murders. In case the title wasn't a giveaway, The Toolbox Murders is based around a masked fella who kills people with a wide array of instruments you'd find in most toolboxes. Prior to becoming widely available in the 2000s, this 1978 feature garnered a reputation for being a gruesome video nasty thanks to being banned in the UK. Truth be told, The Toolbox Murders is no more graphic than your average horror offering, but censors of the time were in the midst of banning anything even remotely bloody. For the most part, The Toolbox Murders focuses on the whodunit aspect of its killer as body bodies pile up in an apartment complex. Even when this Dennis Donnelly helmed picture reveals the identity of its masked murderer, there are still a couple of swerves to come. Plus, this is a film that uses electric drills, hammers, screwdrivers, nail guns, and more as inventive murder weapons. It's certainly not worth the notoriety that plagued it for so long, and The Toolbox Murders is one of those essential slasher films that any horror hound worth their salt should be checking out. Also, this is a movie that the legendary Stephen King has as one of his all-time favourites, so that should tell you all you need to know. Lucky. The Natasha Kamani directed Lucky is part slasher movie, part psychological thriller. Here we have May, a self-help author who is stalked in her home every single night by a masked man. Even when she kills the strange figure, that's still not enough to stop him, for once again he returns to terrify the very next night. The film is one that has a grander message pertaining to the mental and physical abuse that some women experience at the hands of men. Whilst it's best to steer clear of going into the ins and out of the plot too much, one thing that can be said is just how damn phenomenal Brie 
Grant is as she carries the vast majority of the minimalistic Lucky on her back. If you're looking for a slasher movie that has a little bit more going on than the norm, Lucky is the perfect choice. Blood Widow. Released in 2014, Blood Widow nicely flips one of the usual tired tropes of the slasher genre on its head by having its central masked killer be female. The plot of this picture is solid enough, but what's most impressive about Blood Widow is its villain. Played by Gabrielle Anne Henry, the mysterious Blood Widow looks like a total badass and is as clinical and brutal as any of her peers. In terms of said plot, that involves a couple moving to their dream home out in the middle of nowhere. When some friends come to visit, the group's decision to explore an abandoned boarding school sees them soon in the crosshairs of the Blood Widow. While the movie does threaten to derail once it starts to position its titular villain as sympathetic, it thankfully steers away from that by fully embracing the fact that, regardless of her backstory, the Blood Widow is a twisted, sadistic killer. For those with a taste for the grim and gruesome, Blood Widow has one particularly gnarly leg break sequence once it hits its final act. As for its main attraction, it's a genuine shame that a planned sequel, Blood Widow Lives, has been stuck in development hell for these past few years. Twitch of the Death Nerve. Twitch of the Death Nerve, also known as A Bay of Blood, which, let's face it, is nowhere near as cool a name as Twitch of the Death Nerve, is a film that can be viewed as a precursor to the slasher subgenre that came to the fore in the late 1970s and throughout the 80s. From the legendary Mario Bava, this 1971 forefather of the slasher has a habit of being overlooked when it comes to the classics of the subgenre, even more so when Black Christmas and Halloween are usually credited with kickstarting slasher movies. Complete with all the charms of the very best giallo features, Twitch of the Death Nerve has way more going on plot-wise than the more traditional traditional slashers that would follow it. For a start, the person responsible for the opening scene murder of his wife is immediately killed himself, which is a brilliant curveball upon a first watch. At the crux of Twitch of the Death Nerve is the bay owned by the aforementioned husband and wife duo. Following these deaths, a slew of characters have their eyes on taking possession of said bay, all while dead bodies turn up at an alarming rate. Dress to Kill. For its first 15 minutes, you'd be forgiven for thinking 1980s Dress to Kill was a porno. There's a ridiculous amount of skin, plentiful sexual tension, and a whole lot of knowing looks and come to bed eyes. Once this Brian De Palma picture moves away from the glistening naked bodies though, it finally begins to venture into full slasher territory. The raunchy opening of Dress to Kill is done to establish how unhappy Angie Dickinson's Kate Miller is with her sex life. Unfulfilled, Kate flirts with a man at the local art museum before going back to his place to get Get it on. Post deed, an unknown blonde woman slashes Dickinson's character to death as she enters a lift. Unfortunately for call girl Liz, played by Nancy Allen, she's in the wrong place at the wrong time as she finds herself on the other side of the elevator door as it opens. Getting a glimpse at the killer, Liz makes herself this murderer's next target, while she's also made the prime suspect in Kate's murder. From there, Liz teams up with Kate's inventor son, Peter, as they look to solve this murder and survive joining Kate in the ground. The initial response to Dress to Kill was a strange one, with this film receiving praise in some quarters whilst also being nominated at the first ever Golden Raspberry Awards. Bad Dreams 1988's Bad Dreams is a movie that's often vetoed as a blatant rip-off of the previous year's smash hit A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and it's easy to see this argument as both star Jennifer Rubin and both feature a charred antagonist appearing only in visions. The movie follows Cynthia, the only survivor of a doomsday suicide cult as she awakens from a 13-year coma. Still haunted by visions of her child cult leader, Cynthia is alarmed when her visions start to play out in reality. I would be too, to be honest. The first thing to note about Bad Dreams is that it is very well made. 20th Century Fox sank $5 million into this slasher flick, and it wasn't wasted. Beautiful photography and sleek direction immediately elevate Bad Dreams and brings a sense of class to the killings. Jennifer Rubin shines as the traumatised final girl Cynthia, while Richard Lynch is wonderfully sinister and perfectly cast as our villain. Although this may have been a Kruger cash grab by Fox, Bad Dreams certainly transcends the similarities to become its own unique film. Visiting Hours this Canadian slasher follows an ambitious reporter who finds herself targeted by a masochistic, misogynistic psycho. Surviving his brutal attack, she is admitted to hospital where he seeks her out and continues to torment her. Once again, we have 20th Century Fox sparring no expense and bringing us this beautifully made, surprisingly dark slow burn slasher. Much like the previous year's Halloween 2, Visiting Hours takes full advantage of its hospital setting with long, dark corridors aplenty. There is a permanent feeling of dread and discomfort as we're not quite sure if the threat is just around the corner. If you want a slasher with a subtle feminist message and endless cat and mouse antics, Visiting Hours is definitely worth checking out. Silent Scream this criminally underrated flick follows student Scotty as she takes a place at an off-campus boarding house run by the peculiar Engels family. 
Soon, borders begin meeting grisly ends and the local police suspect the mysterious family. Silent Scream takes a cue from Hitchcock's Psycho and uses a similar family with a secret plot thread. Although the audience is let in quite early on as to what this secret is, it still doesn't make the film any less effective. A wonderfully eerie atmosphere permeates this picture, putting the viewer on edge as we implore characters to leave this rambling, creepy mansion. The movie's high tension is aided by an incredible cast, including Scream Queen Barbara Steele and Hollywood legends Yvonne De Carlo and Cameron Mitchell. The presence of such fine actors ensures a plot which could seem high camp in hindsight is always taken seriously. Still sadly overlooked today, Silent Scream remains an effective and eerie ride. Death Valley Following in the footsteps of Wes Craven's The Hills Have Eyes, 1982's Death Valley replaces hungry cannibals with a serial killer that has a fondness for sharp objects. They often do, though. The movie follows a young family as they pass through California on a road trip vacation. Unfortunately, their curious child stumbles across a murder scene and becomes the killer's next target before he can identify him to the authorities. Death Valley takes the unusual step of having the protagonist be a nine-year-old boy, with the stellar turn from Peter Billingsley being the movie's crowning asset. The young actor is lovably sarcastic but never grates on the viewer, which can't be said about a lot of child actors, especially in horror. I'm looking at you, Samuel, from the Babadook. You really can go and eat Anyway, the vast desert setting adds a different kind of paranoia to Death Valley than that of the average slasher as well. Here, there are no places to hide as the desert stretches as far as the eye can see. Even then though, we know a slash happy killer still lurks somehow unseen in the wide open space. Moonstalker this cheesy late 80s offering tells the story of Bernie, a local legend whispered about at campfires. He has returned to the snowy Nevada wilderness to reclaim his childhood home. What sets Moonstalker apart from the sea of slashers is the setting. This movie is a winter camp slasher as opposed to the usual Somerset fodder. The change in season adds untold atmosphere to the campy little story, no pun intended, as campfires glow menacingly against a bleak, snowy wilderness. All the traditional slasher movie trappings are here to be enjoyed too. There is gore aplenty, some ridiculous 80s hair and fashion, and even a knockoff Halloween style score from future Academy Award winner Douglas Pipes. It all adds to Moonstalker's undeniable charm. Had this film received more attention, the Stetson clad antagonist Bernie could easily have become a B movie horror icon. His familial motive certainly jives with the horror heavyweights of the time, and his methods of execution are certainly viscerally varied. All of the 80s cheese and horror cliches wrapped up in a surprisingly cold and bleak setting make Moonstalker one to seek out. Balancing camp with a truly menacing atmosphere is an impressive feat for any no-budget picture, and it's a shame that no label has opted to rescue this obscure gem yet. Hell Knight the film follows a group of four college pledges who must prove their loyalty to their peers by spending the night in the abandoned Garth Manor. Unfortunately, the old manor isn't as abandoned as it seems. Two things set Hell Knight apart from similarly themed college slasher films of the time. The first being the glorious production and costume design. Characters are swathed in outlandish fancy dress as the terror unfolds and the manor setting is laden with dancing candles and antique furnishings. When these impressive and unconventional elements are combined with very strong performances from a likeable cast, one cannot help but find Hell Knight quite charming. Our favourite possessed queen Linda Blair tackles final girl Marty with gusto and her Victorian era costume gives her tense chase scenes an atmosphere akin to a Hammer horror film. Although relatively light on gore, Hell Knight remains engaging thanks to wonderfully witty dialogue courtesy of future Hollywood heavyweight Chuck Russell and stunningly crafted visuals. Halloween producer Erwin Yablins again shows us that a modest budget does not have to make for a bad or boring film. The Mutilator the Mutilator follows a lad called Ed and his college buddies as they head to the beach to close up his father's condo. Unbeknownst to them, Ed's father is still around and plans on using his trusty set of weapons to dispatch each one of them. The Mutilator is a tale of lingering rage and resentment finally brought to boil, as Ed's drunken father finally decides to slaughter his son for accidentally killing his wife years before. Ordinarily, this would be quite a grim storyline, but the Mutilator is slathered in so much 80s cheese that it becomes an undeniably enjoyable watch. Director Buddy Cooper does his best with what's at his disposal, cutting budgetary corners by shooting at his family's beachfront motel. He opts to use his budget on some elements that would make the mutilator stand tall above the crowd. The pounding synth score and buckets of impressive practical gore, including disembowelment, decapitation, and a hook to a particularly sensitive area, make the movie prime slasher cinema viewing. As an audience, we await the next savage gore scene hungrily to see if it outdoes the last. 
The Mutilator stands out from the crowd by somehow managing to be unapologetic with its gruesomeness, but endearingly cheesy at the same time. Honeymoon Horror Honeymoon Horror follows business owners Elaine and Vic as they prepare to welcome three newlywed couples to their lover's island honeymoon resort. However, someone uninvited prowls the island thirsty for blood. Sounds pretty much like Love Island. When one considers that this picture was made for a mere $200,000 in just two weeks, the final feature seems a lot more impressive than it has any right to be. But the acting on show isn't particularly good, and the tired comedy cops routine in particular is groan-inducing. However, the eerie isolated setting and a surprisingly unsettling ambient score make for some particularly tense moments. The gore, when it comes, is unflinching and brutal, successfully keeping the little scene killer an ever-present threat. The movie was the first ever film to be released direct to video, in a move by Sony to take advantage of a newfangled market. Evidently, it worked, as Honeymoon Horror went on to gross $25 million. Today, the film can only be seen on faded VHS rips, having never received an updated release. Doesn't that seem a little unfair, given the profit this little movie made? The Fan The Fan stars Lauren Bacall as an ageing Hollywood legend that finds herself targeted by an obsessive fan convinced that they're meant to be together. With its simple premise of the perils of fame, the fan could have easily turned into a preachy commentary on celebrity worship. However, brilliant filmmaking and absolutely flawless visuals make it almost impossible to tear one's eyes from this picture. With stunning cinematography, a wonderful score and performances from Hollywood icons, the fan is top tier horror. Bacall shines as she surrenders the icy cool she is so famous for and gives into fear as her character's life crumbles around her. Terminator's Michael Bean tackles his first leading role with ease too. Despite his good looks and childlike manner, when Bean turns sinister, he elicits chills. The fan is similar in tone and style to the works of both Alfred Hitchcock and Brian De Palma, and so well made and engrossing that it seems almost a shame to call it a slasher. Unfortunately, the movie was savaged upon release and subsequently disowned by Bacall. I'm guessing that she wasn't a fan? Yeah? Basket Case 3. Basket Case famously follows a man named Dwayne who carries around in a basket the body of his conjoined twin, and the two plan on murdering the surgeons who separated them at birth. Now, for as bonkers and as weirdly iconic as this original movie definitely is, its sequels are somehow even zanier, and Basket Case 3 especially definitely shouldn't be overlooked. That's because in the series' third outing, Belial manages to impregnate a woman giving birth to 12 of his children. However, when the progeny are kidnapped by the police, Belial is forced to go on another killing spree to get them back. Now, is Basket Case 3 a great film? No, it's not even a little bit. But is it more original than more slashes? Yes, yes, it absolutely is. This thing is, this thing is nuts. So, if you've grown tired of how derivative the genre is, this sequel will feel like a welcome change of pace. After all, Basket Case 3 is the only slasher to conclude with a bodiless serial killer hunting his victims in a robotic exoskeleton. Yep, spoilers, but that actually happens. And for those reasons alone, it's definitely worth a watch. Body Bags Body Bags was originally envisioned as a horror anthology TV show, but when Showtime pulled the plug on the project, it was instead reworked into a TV movie. And that's a shame, because Body Bags as a concept and as a pilot had, pardon the pun, bags of potential. I'm so sorry. Not only did John Carpenter, yes that one, write and direct the first two tales, he also plays a creepy mortician and the overseeing narrator. And it's also worth mentioning how the Halloween director is a surprisingly charismatic actor with a comedic timing that is just perfect. He's really, really good in this role. Now, the first story is a conventional slasher, following a serial killer who's stalking a newly hired attendant at the gas station. The second chapter centers around Stacey Keach's character changing physically and mentally after having an experimental hair transplant, because of course, I guess. And in the final story, Mark Hamill's character, yeah, that one, finds himself experiencing murderous urges after he's surgically implanted with the eye of a serial killer. And come on, that makes so much sense. We all know that a serial killer's power and evilness is stored in the eye. Like, if you don't know that, then you need to get some homework done. All in all, it's great stuff. There's some amazing cameos in there, as you can probably guess from the names I've just reeled off, and it's such a shame that we didn't get a full series of this. Campfire Tales. 
The film opens with a bunch of teens crashing their car in the woods, and while waiting to be rescued, they decide, for some reason, to start sharing scary stories. You guessed it, all around a campfire. While sharing these scary stories though, they are completely unaware that a real life killer is actually stalking the group and planning on picking them off one by one. Although horror anthologies aren't anything new, I mean we were just talking about one not two minutes ago, it's this framing device that makes this movie really work and really sell the tension. Even though the three scary stories that are told are creepy in their own right, it's every time you return to the campfire and you notice that one of these people are in danger that the movie really comes to life and becomes something really memorable. So, if you manage to stumble on this gem, definitely give it a watch. By the end of watching Campfire Tales, you'll be asking yourself, why don't more people know about this? Popcorn. In Popcorn, college student Maggie and the rest of her classmates decide to attend an all-night horror marathon in an abandoned theatre. And during the all-night horrorthon, Maggie discovers there's actually a killer in the building who she believes to be Lanyard Gates, a deranged filmmaker who murdered his entire family. Now, based on that premise alone, you might be expecting an even cornier version of something like The Phantom of the Opera, but there is more to this movie than just the wacky premise. And that's because Popcorn itself never feels like a generic slasher, and really does take its time to immerse you into its characters. Also, it helps that the visuals throughout are just top-notch. Maggie's kaleidoscopic dream sequences are hypnotically trippy, and the practical effects for the killer's look are inventive as well. Generally, it's all just a cut above what you'd expect from a film like this. Without spoiling the killer's identity as well, the actor portraying him is incredible at making him come across as sympathetic, even when he's hamming it up like a pantomime villain. And while he's chewing the scenery in every single scene that he's in, you can't just help feel a little bit sorry for him as a character. Like I said, it's surprisingly strong material here. Maniac Cop 2. Maniac Cop follows murdered police officer Matt Cordell as he rises from the grave and goes on a killing spree across New York. And while this first film was funny enough, you could argue that it didn't need a sequel at all. I mean, how much more can you get from this premise? Well, as it turns out, quite a bit. That's because this time around, Cordell teams up with another serial killer, making his rampages even more lethal. Also, Maniac Cop 2 kinda does the whole protege of a serial killer thing better than Halloween ends, which, you know, make of that what you will. Not only are the kills bigger and bloodier this time around, but the car chases in particular look so dangerous, it's kinda hard to believe that the stunt drivers didn't get killed during filming. Like, I don't want to speak for anyone, but this thing, this thing doesn't look safe. But hey, maybe that's just the power of really good filmmaking tricking my brain. Also, it's just really fun and kind of insane to watch Cordell himself start butchering his victims while he's on fire. Like, not metaphorically on fire, not that he's doing really well and is on, like, a kill streak or anything like that, like in Call of Duty. Like, the guy's literally on fire and he's still, he's still going to task on these guys. It's, uh, it's impressive going for a, for a movie killer out, that's all I'm gonna say. Generally, Maniac Cop 2 is just so fun that it makes the first one just seem like a bit of a bit of a warm-up. The Guard from Underground. Kiyoshi Kurosawa is hugely responsible for popularizing modern Japanese horror. The dude is an absolute veteran of the genre, and although Kurosawa is renowned for horrors like Cure and Pulse, he deserves more recognition for his first slasher, The Guard from Underground, aka the security guard from hell. The story revolves around a, well, a security guard called Akiko, who suspects her co-worker, a former sumo wrestler called Fujimaru, is actually a killer. Rather than focusing on gore or outright scares, the guard from underground is absolutely dripping in tension from start to finish, as you would probably expect if you've seen the other works from this director. And despite almost functioning as a creature feature at times, because the film emphasizes Akiko's personal issues and frustrations with her job, she comes across as a very relatable protagonist. She keeps the movie grounded and the suspense is all the better for it. Put simply, it's a great movie that barely gets any attention and definitely needs to be seen. Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight. Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight is the kind of film that you just have to see to believe. I can't believe this thing exists, that a studio backed it and released it in cinemas. That's just, that's crazy. A totally unhinged supernatural 90s slasher, the movie sees a group of people holed up at a rundown motel surrounded by demons. The issue? Well, 
Inside lies Frank, a do-gooder who's stolen an apocalypse-starting item that the hellhounds outside need to complete a ritual. And who's in charge of the demons? Well, it's none other than Billy Zane, who gives an absolutely unhinged performance and a hysterical performance as the leader of the demons, known as the Collector. Like, this guy is just seriously menacing and hilarious every time he's on screen as he tries to pit the survivors against each other and ultimately starts picking them off one by one in classic slasher fashion. So, while this one on the surface might not look like your average slasher, like there's no guy in a mask walking around some woods taking out teenagers or anything like that, it definitely is in spirit. With some truly incredible practical effects, this is the kind of rough and ready horror movie that you definitely just don't see in cinemas anymore. And with that in mind, you can kind of see why it completely bombed. The entire movie is pretty much held together by duct tape, but it is just so, so charming because of it. I had the pleasure of seeing a 35mm print of this thing after an all-night marathon at a cinema watching it at 5am. And let me tell you, that's exactly how this thing was meant to be seen. Anything else is doing it a disservice, so next time you're up late and you want to watch something, scroll over, get this thing on, and just, like, lose your mind for a little bit. Funny games. Whoa, 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 hold your horses. I know you've seen Funny Games. It's one of the most infamous horror movies of all time. But have you seen the original. Also probably yes, but let me off with this one because some of you out there might not have. And no shame if you haven't. I mean, the remake is literally shot for shot and from the same director. So as a result, a bunch of people have just seen the American version and not gone back to the original. However, it is absolutely worth your time to go back and see why this was such a thing to begin with. Now, if you are unaware, in the opening scene of Funny Games, George, Annie and their son Georgie are driving to their holiday cabin. And shortly after the family arrive, two young men enter the cabin and begin torturing them, escalating the violence to the point where the movie quite literally just goes off the rails. More than just a chilling horror in its own right, Funny Games, even today, still works as an astute bit of social commentary and a meta-commentary on the genre as a whole. However, even though Funny Games is excellent, I imagine there's only a few people out there who actually enjoyed it because this thing is intentionally miserable and it will make you miserable while you're watching it. But, you know, in the good way, the good kind of miserable, the horror kind of miserable. Star Time. Star Time follows the troubled Henry Pinkle who's obsessed with a TV show called The Robertson Family and goes off the deep end when that show is cancelled. In fact, he's left so devastated that he has no will to live without the show and contemplates killing himself. Just as he's ready to end his life, though, a mysterious agent appears before Henry, promising to make him the star of his own series, if he kills on the agency's behalf. So, adopting the moniker of the Baby Mask Killer, Henry begins his murder spree, believing it'll pave the road to fame and fortune. Spoilers, but you, you might be able to see where this one's going. Now, Star Time immediately stands out as it's one of the only real slasher movies where the hero is also the villain, and not in the way where you only realise that at the very end, like at high tension or something. It's, it's right there from the outset. He makes a deal with the devil, essentially, and then becomes the villain, but you're in his head pretty much the entire time. And because you see everything from his warped viewpoint, you're given a real insight into his mindset, even though, of course, you don't condone his actions. You just have a little bit more of an understanding about what's going on with the character. With that in mind, then, it's a unique premise that, with a few modernizations, of course, wouldn't feel too out of place today. Mute Witness. Mute Witness follows a makeup artist called Billy, who believes that she's working on a slasher movie. But after getting locked in the studio after hours, she actually sees some of the actors performing a pornographic scene, which was not in the script. And at the end of that scene, the performers actually kill the actress involved, at which point Billy realizes she's not making a fictional slasher movie, she's actually involved in a snuff film. Of course, this sparks her flight or fight response and Billy realizes that she needs to escape from the studio, find the police, and alert them of the crime that she's just witnessed. There's only one problem though. Billy can't speak. Which in this situation is a problem because she's trapped in the studio and can't just phone the authorities. Although Mute Witness might sound like a gimmicky slasher, and in parts it kind of is, it's elevated by the compelling cast, especially this great central performance. 
Also, Obi-Wan Kenobi himself, Alec Guinness, is part of the cast, so what more motivation do you need to go out and watch this one? Pieces. Timmy's a 10-year-old boy who murders his mother with an axe after she finds it with a jigsaw puzzle of a naked lady. Of course, that's always a sane and rational way to deal with being told off by a parent. Being even more of a little turd, Timmy pretends to have witnessed his mother's murder when the police find her chopped up remains. 40 years later, a Boston college campus finds itself in the midst of a sinister figure who not only kills people, but removes certain body parts as part of these attacks. There's actually a nice slice of whodunit to pieces, as several people are teased as being responsible for these murders. And the eventual reveal comes complete with a bonkers mishmash of a corpse that's made out of the various body parts assembled across the film's 90 minute runtime. Edge of the Axe If looking for an underrated, brisk, fun popcorn slasher, Edge of the Axe is a great shout. Helmed by Jose Ramon Larraz, here we have a small community where a masked killer is running wild. But this is a slasher where there's a little more going on than simply mindless kill after mindless kill after mindless kill. Instead, the victims of this maniac all end up linked together, and the inevitable reveal of the identity of this 1988 film's villain involves quite the twist. Edge of the Axe may not be one for the big time gore hounds, but it very much doesn't overstay its welcome. It has some strong performances at its core, Barton Falks being a particular standout, and actually nicely leaves itself open for a sequel that, sadly, never came to be. The Initiation up on a first watch, The Initiation is your pretty run-of-the-mill, college kids get stalked by a killer sort of slasher movie. As Daphne Zuniga's Kelly has strange visions of a house fire and a burning man, she and her sorority pals find themselves tormented by a murderous figure. So far, so very formulaic. Thankfully though, there's a little more going on here than in some of this 1984 picture's contemporaries. What's the meaning of these nightmarish visions? Who is the fiery figure? And what does all of this have to do with a pile of dead bodies being slowly amassed? All very valid questions, and all part of a genuinely intriguing plot. It kind of feels a little redundant to hold off on giving too many details about a film that's now nearly 40 years old, but such as the ultimate endgame of the initiation, it's still something that should be approached as blind as possible upon an initial viewing. Slaughter High Playing very much like Troma's beloved first Toxic Avenger movie during its opening moments, 1986's Slaughter High begins as nerdy Marty Ranson gets seduced by one of the popular girls of his high school class. Of course, this is all a setup for a prank that leaves poor Marty naked and embarrassed by a bunch of bullies. But things turn even more sour when Marty is left horrendously disfigured due to a prank in the school science lab. When a high school reunion takes place 10 years later, the only ones to receive an invite are these bullies. Arriving at the closed, dilapidated school, the group decides to break in and just have a party regardless where they're then offed one by one by someone wearing a jester mask. It doesn't take a genius to realize that this killer is indeed Marty, and Slaughter High doesn't do much to really hide that fact. Still, this troubled fella has some mighty fun ways to dispatch of those who make this high school years miserable. Acid-laced beer, causing someone's insides to explode, check. Filling someone's bathtub with acid, check. Electrocuting a couple while they have sex, double check. Terror Train Sticking with the theme of bullied young adults seeking revenge for something horrible that happened to them, that horrible doesn't get much more twisted than what happened to Kenny Hampson in the early goings of Terror Train. This 1980 picture positions Kenny as your standard nerd, who is of course the butt of people's jokes. Much like Marty of Slaughter High though, it's again a pretty lady utilized to lure poor Kenny in. That pretty lady is actually the legendary Jamie Lee Curtis, who is convinced to take Kenny to a bedroom on the promise of sex. When the lights go off and Kenny gets into bed though, he actually discovers he's cozied up to a corpse that the kids have stolen from the medical department. Rightly traumatized by this encounter, Kenny spends the next three years locked up in a psychiatric hospital before resurfacing to target his tormentors during a costume party they're holding on a train for some reason on New Year's Eve. Part of the fun of Terror Trade is the wide variety of costumes that play throughout the film's train ride with Kenny taking on several different guises before he finally confronts Jamie Lee Curtis's Alana during the movie's finale, Blood Rage. Anchored by a great, often erratic turn from Mark Soper in Dual Rose, 1987's Blood Rage revolves around twin brothers Todd and Terry. As youngsters, these siblings are taken along for one of their mother's dates at a drive-in theater. But the two take a walk, which shockingly concludes when Terry kills some horned up teenager with an axe. If that wasn't enough, he then puts the bloody weapon in the hands of his traumatized twin brother, with Todd framed and locked up in a mental institution. Skipping ahead to Thanksgiving 10 years later, the announcement of his mother's engagement triggers Terry's murderous urges to resurface, conveniently at the same time that Todd has just escaped. 
the bodies pile up, questions arise once it becomes apparent that Todd is back on the scene and Blood Rage serves up some fantastically imaginative sequences as torsos are ripped in half and beer holding hands are severed. Plus, there's a blink and you'll miss it cameo from genre fave Ted Raimi as a fella randomly selling condoms in the public restroom. As you do. The Undertaker. Frank Stefanino is The Undertaker. Yes, it's a hidden gem slasher movie that was literally hidden for the longest time. You see, The Undertaker never received a theatrical release, nor did it receive a VHS release, and supposedly the only finished copy belonged to star Joe Spinell. When Spinell passed away shortly after the movie was completed in 1988, the film became somewhat of a white whale for horror hands, with various bootleg versions eventually surfacing. 2016 though, that would see The Undertaker finally recut and restored for a Blu-ray release, and the movie can nowadays be found on streamer services such as Prime Video. It may not be the greatest of films, mind, but this is one worth seeking out solely for how long it was literally impossible to find. As for the plot, it's a largely paint-by-numbers affair as Spinell plays an Undertaker, in case you haven't guessed, with a penchant for killing young women. Some of the acting is pretty painful in parts, and the editing is a little ropey in places. But again, The Undertaker deserves a spot on this list due to its rather unique spot in slasher movie history. Psycho 2 Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho is obviously one of the most famous, influential films in the history of cinema, period. But what most people don't talk about is that picture's sequels. Granted, some of those follow-ups are a little rough around the edges, but 1983's Psycho 2 is an absolute belter. Picking things up as Anthony Perkins' Norman Bates is freed after 22 years in a mental asylum, Psycho 2 centers on Norman as he tries to reintegrate himself into society, all as a spate of new murders begin to take place in and around the infamous Bates Motel. Perkins is absolutely fantastic here, conveying a whole slew of emotions as his Norman genuinely doesn't know whether his mother personality is back and committing these murders. Elsewhere, we have the presence of Lila Loomis, the sister of Marion Crane, and there's also some serious revelations about Norman's backstory. It's always going to be a tough ask to deliver a sequel to Psycho, let alone a sequel that arrived 23 years after that classic was first released. But Psycho 2 delivers a fascinating tale that deserves to reach a wider audience. Go and check it out. 